It's my great pleasure to be talking to Dr. John Huddleston, uh, Professor of Religious Studies at the College of Charleston. And I want to learn something about the Bible. I've always been fascinated by it. Um, we're all familiar with the idea that the first chapter of Genesis, the creation myth of the Jews, is not historical. But what about the rest of Genesis? What about Abraham? Is, did Abraham ever exist? Uh, probably not. I think if you, if you look at the book of Genesis, which is presented as a kind of family history, if you continue down and even look at the book of Exodus, uh, historically speaking or archaeologically speaking, uh, there really is no evidence for any of the events that took place in, in either of those books. The so way there, the, there, was, no, there yeah. was no captivity of the Jews in Egypt, for example? Uh, there's no evidence from Egypt for any, any of that at all. Um, the only evidence, the only mention of Israel, in fact, the very earliest mention of the name Israel outside the biblical text is an Egyptian text that dates to around 1200 BCE, and it mentions this one particular pharaoh says he conquered uh, a number of peoples to the north and among the list of peoples he defeated the name Israel appears but it doesn't tell us anything else about what that Israel means. it's simply the name Israel which probably in this case refers to a people or maybe the land they inhabit but you can't say anything else about that other than the name appears at that point but even that I mean 1200 BC is not very old is it I mean that in terms of ancient Near Eastern history no I mean the biblical history and characters like Abraham and Moses, in terms of the larger ancient Near Eastern or ancient Middle Eastern history, they appear very late on the scene. Yes. So the whole sort of Jewish tribal myth of being taken in captivity to, well, Abraham first and then Isaac and Jacob and Joseph, I mean, taken into, the, into captivity in Egypt, led out of Egypt by the great hero Moses, uh, Moses coming down from the mountain with the Ten Commandments, no historical basis at all to any of that? Yeah, there's, there's simply no evidence for that. People try to, uh, people cite what they might call circumstantial evidence. For, the, for example, in the history of ancient Egypt as a whole, going back long before the biblical text, you do have Semites, people from the north who from time to time came down to Egypt for various reasons. Uh, some people, scholars have argued, it's not impossible that some tiny little group maybe of, of Semites or Asiatics left Egypt at one point, wound up in the Arabian or desert, met up with another group of people who worshipped this god named Yahweh, for example, and then wound up going up into uh, Palestine, meeting with another group, and yeah. that became, over time, what we call Israel. Well, uh, I wanted to come on to the, yeah. to the, to the god and gods. Mm -hmm. um, the Jewish religion, of course, is famously monotheistic, and, and Christianity and Islam have inherited this monotheism. Um, how did that start? I mean, w w were, they, were they originally polytheistic and then settled on one tribal god, or how did it work? You have to distinguish between Judaism, and when you use the term Jew, and talk about ancient Israelite religion, because they're actually very different types of things. But to come to the question of monotheism, it only appears, uh, based on what we know from the text, uh, at a fairly late period in the term in the period of the exile or just before the exile the exile meaning to Babylon right the Babylonian yeah, exile yeah. in the sixth century but even there that's the first time you get a reference to there's this particular God and no other gods and that's astonishingly um, recent only 600 BC or actually yeah later than that probably maybe in the 530s Five, or 530s. 540s so but, monotheism yeah. is, n is not that old in 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 Jewish history no no. Uh, before that, they had their one god, the national god that they worshipped. But it's clear from the text that there were other gods which, around. Which they believed existed, but yeah. they, they damn well better not worship yeah. them. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, even that's problematic because the prophets, as you know, the prophets are constantly going on rants against people worshipping other gods and the way they worship other gods, which tells you, oh, there must have been other gods. Uh, otherwise, they wouldn't be so concerned about this. But the, well, there were other tribes, I mean, the yeah. other Canaanite tribes who worshipped other gods. Is that, was that how it worked? Or, well, I, no, it, what we know about in the ancient Israelites, not simply in the biblical text, but outside the biblical text from archaeological evidence and other kinds of inscriptions, uh, is that people worshipped Israel's main god, uh, who uh, is, has the name Yahweh, pronounced something like Yahweh, but they also worshipped other gods as well. Uh, there's a very famous inscription written on a big part of a big jar from uh, the 8th century BCE that mentions Israel's God Yahweh and it says Yahweh 
and his Asherah. Asherah is the name of a Canaanite goddess. And that inscription seems to indicate that they worship Yahweh as the, the male deity, and then Asherah was his female consort. <laughs> There's a lot of evidence for that. Yes. But you won't see that in the biblical text. The biblical text presents the kind of official history of what, the, what, they, what it should have been. But when you get outside of that and look at uh, archaeological and other evidence for family religion or household religion or private religion, mm. it's another story. Yeah, right. Now, what about um, King David? Is, is, is he a historical figure? Good question. Um, we have no evidence for David uh, existing in the 10th century. Uh, we have no evidence for Jerusalem in the 10th century under David and Solomon being this capital of a mighty empire uh, with international relations the way the biblical text presents it. Um, but it's difficult. It's, you, you can't make the claim that David simply didn't exist. It could have been David and Solomon could have been what are fairly minor kings. Or tri with a tribal very, chieftains. Yeah, with yeah. a very small, um, I don't know if I'd use the word state. Uh, the only evidence that's come to light outside of the biblical text, because that's what people usually talk about, are, uh, is uh, an inscription that in the, in the midst of this inscription, it talks about the house of David. By house of David, they mean the dynasty of David. Uh, but that's a text that's a couple hundred years later. But people have made the argument, if there's a house of David, then obviously there must have been a David to establish this kind of dynasty. But in terms of actual evidence, archeological evidence or other kinds of evidence, we simply have nothing that, that puts a David or a Solomon in this, in this period. Uh, what's interesting is all their connections with all these other nations and marrying the daughters of other kings. That we, we know of later kings, not David and Solomon, but after David and Solomon, kings of the northern kingdom, like what Omri and the Omri dynasty, they apparently were very powerful and influential figures. Okay, so you mentioned um, the northern kingdom. We're coming on yeah. now to the split between the northern yeah. kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Um, now, that's real, is it? There, re there, there really were two kingdoms. And, they, yes. and the list of kings that we, that we have for those two kingdoms, are they, are they pretty authentic? Well, all you can say is we do have references outside the biblical text, in the Syrian text, for example, uh, that mention some of these kings by name. But what's interesting is they mention kings that the biblical writers don't like. If you take Ahab, for example, you may know Ahab is not a very nice character in the biblical text. The biblical text portrays him as a very weak military figure. But if you look at texts outside the Bible, Assyrian texts again, Assyrian uh, annals or military inscriptions, they clearly show that Ahab and that dynasty and Omri and, and Jehu were powerful and influential kings. So you have a disconnect between how the biblical text presents this, because the biblical writers have their own theological or ideological uh, assumptions. They're, they're writing a theological history, uh, and it's much different when you get some kind of information outside the text. Well, you, you make frequent reference to the distinction between biblical texts and texts from outside the Bible. Um, you seem to be making the assumption that biblical texts are not to be taken seriously unless there's some authentication from outside authorities. Why is that? What, why, why do you devalue the biblical text compared to the, uh, to the outside? I, 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 would, I would say none of these ancient texts, Egyptian, Mesopotamian, Hittite, Edomite, Moabite, take all those ites people, none of those texts should be read face value. Right. Uh, any serious historian who practices you know, history, the discipline of history or historiography, you, you don't just read the text and you don't read the text and assume everything happened. You have to have other ways of dealing with the text. In case of the, in the biblical text, there are cases where we have outside evidence to corroborate a biblical narrative or the existence of a king who did certain things. Uh, at other times, the evidence points in the opposite direction. So the kind of, you hear some people say, well, the Bible, it's all true or it's all false. And that's a, that's a horrible of false course. dichotomy. Yeah. Well, we have, um, we, yes, okay. You have to look at each example on its own. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, what about the, um, the, the Assyrian came down like a wolf on the fold and his cohorts were gleaming in purple and gold? Um, that was a, a historical event, the Assyrian invasion he, um, of the northern kingdom, was it? Is that, a, is that from Nahum? 
I know I'm asking you a biblical oh, scholar. Oh, that's not, no, no, that's a poem by... Um, <laughs> oh, oh yeah, that, that, that is based on the book of Nahum. Okay. Nahum is a prop, yeah. it's a very short little, everyone's yeah. favorite biblical book, Nahum and Habakkuk, I always yes. say. Uh, that actually was the destruction of Nineveh in 612, which the biblical writer uh, is rejoicing that the, that, the Assyrian, that the Assyrian city, the capital city, was destroyed. Uh, and it's and gloating in incredible ways over the destruction and talking about women and children and children literally being dashed against the rocks right. uh, as yeah. they were killed. It's a wonderful text. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what about the Babylonian captivity? Uh, that there clearly was some kind of exile, uh, but not on the the level or the scale that the biblical text presents. Uh, so it wasn't that an entire people was carted off to Babylon. Yeah, it, was, it wasn't an empty yeah. land. This is how scholars deal with yeah. this, the whole kind of empty land idea. We think that everyone was carted off to Babylonia, you know, marry their, you know, yeah. marry Babylonian yes. wives, have 2.5 Babylonian By the waters of Babylon, we sat down yeah. and wept. Yeah. Yes. But th there was, they would have taken off people into exile who were uh, of use to them. So the king and anyone connected with his... Uh, the whole bureaucracy, people who had a particular talent that they would find useful. But there were a lot of people that stayed back in the land. Yeah. Uh, and there were people who didn't come back out of exile from Babylon. Babylon, as you know, in Jewish history became a major center for Jewish learning, and, there you, and therefore you have the Babylonian Talmud. So, it was so a, a lot yeah. of the biblical books were written yeah. in Babylon, were they? Uh, I, that's a good question. Um, when they come back, there's a, this guy named Ezra who comes back. Uh, and the text says he brings with him some kind of book of the law of Moses. We don't know exactly what that was. People assume it was some kind of form of maybe what we call the Pentateuch, maybe a few books after that, uh, but there's no actual way of knowing. He had, he had some text, and he had a text because the Persian king who oversaw, when they're coming, they're coming back under Persian authority, and the Persians want the different peoples who were going back to their uh, homelands to reestablish their laws, rebuild their temples, which is what it t yeah. says in the text they're yeah. doing. This was all done to the Persian king's advantage to set up these uh, outlying provinces outlying, yes. okay. and, and to keep yeah. them under control, yes. allow them to establish yeah. their own yeah. laws. What's amazing in the biblical text is all of that is done under Persian authority and they even offer sacrifices on behalf of the Persian king in Jerusalem. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what about the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, um, and so on? Um, when and where did they happen if they did? Hmm. I know I keep saying this, but that's a good question. Hmm. Um, there, there, here you find disputes among uh, scholars that these oracles like Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah, and Amos, the, the actual oracles associated with them were probably written down over a long period of time. You're talking possibly three or four hundred year period. Oh, so they're not individual prophets at all? Well, the issue is to what extent can you go back and find an historical Amos, for example, or an historical Hosea, Hosea because the oracles that are may have been written, written by disciples of theirs. We have a reference to this in the book of Isaiah, that he had followers or disciples, and we know people uh, over time would write down oracles. Uh, there are disputes about did these actual figures actually exist at one point and how much of the oracles presented in the books actually go back to that figure. That's a, that's a debated issue. They're clearly, aside from that, there clearly are additions to these books. People would go in and add another prophecy to, to, uh, to update the book. So if, um, if a prophet is saying Jerusalem is going to be destroyed, uh, and it wasn't destroyed, then at a later period after Jerusalem is destroyed, they go in and it. add. Okay. Th there are famous um, cases of where the biblical writers actually, uh, we know they did this. Yes, I so. mean, not, not, not least, uh, behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. What? Um, yeah. I mean, Isaiah, um, and that of course was taken up by Matthew um, to refer to Jesus, or who, uh, who wasn't called Emmanuel. Yeah. Right. Um, tell us about I, that. Well, I actually do a whole class on that verse. That's yeah. Isaiah 7:14, yeah. because in the biblical te in the Hebrew text, the original text, the word is not virgin. A young woman. The the word is a, a young woman or yeah. maiden. Yeah. The word is uh, Alma, yes. and the word has a definite article. We, so it's the young woman in the biblical text. The prophet Isaiah is standing in the company of the king Ahaz, yeah. and he's saying in the Hebrew text, it's behold. This woman, this woman who's standing here, who is with child, 
is going to have a son and is going to name him Immanuel. And then you have to read the rest of the text because the rest of the text is before this child is too old, before this child eats hard foods, for example, depending on how you interpret this, these two kings before whom you are in dread, which are the kings of uh, uh, Aram or Syria and Israel, they will disappear. This is the whole point of the text. Yeah. The text so really it's, it's has nothing the to do with future. the... It's yeah, it's very... And, and, yeah, I the, should near, the near future. It's very near future. Yeah. So you say, well, well, then how did Matthew get the virgin out of this? He got that from the Greek translation, which has Parthenos. It's related to the word for Parthenon. Yeah. Uh, and, and that Parthenogenesis, word... Parthenogenesis, indeed, yeah, as a, as a exactly, biologist, yeah. yes. And yeah. that term then is picked up by the writer in Matthew. That gospel, by the way, more than any other gospel, has a very... Uh, uh, Matthew constantly uses what we call uh, f fulfillment citation formulas, formulae, yeah. Yeah. where he goes back to find a text. Yes. Never mind the text has yeah. nothing to do with what's yeah. going on in yeah. this period. It's just go find a text that somehow is related to Jesus in yeah. Egypt, for example. Yeah. And, and, well, that and particular cited. verse from Isaiah, Matthew, That particular cited. verse from Isaiah, Matthew actually says, now all this was done, yeah. that the prophet... That's that the, the prophet, citation yeah. formula. Yeah. 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 He does right. the same for... Yes. Yeah, he does it for other texts, yeah. but they, they literally okay. bear no... They're not even, most of them aren't even prophecies. Now, Matthew so, obviously yeah. was not um, Matthew Levi, the tax collector. Um, do we know who Matthew was? Do we know who Mark was, Luke was, John was? No. Okay. Uh, the Gospels are written by anonymous figures whose who's, um, who's, who's names are later added to the text. You can even see it in some cases in the manuscript tradition. The titles you see for books, like the Gospels, the Gospel according to so-and-so, in antiquity they didn't have these titles. You would have had simply a, a story that circulated. Uh, and over time, it it it, be, it becomes associated with a particular right. figure. When were the names Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John grafted onto those um, Gospels? The, the the bulk of the Gospels, in terms of the manuscript tradition, uh, you have to go all the way into the 4th century. 4th century you AD? Were, yeah, yeah, in roughly the middle of the 4th century. There are some fragments of different Gospels. There's one very small piece of a fragment of the Gospel of John, which could be 2nd century. Uh, when you get to that point, uh, there you have the, in the manuscript tradition where they're writing a name. In some cases, the name is not even at the top of the gospel. Yeah. In some cases, it's written on the side of a manuscript. Mm. It's written at the end. Mm. Uh, but it's clear that the, the name attached to it was not the primary. So who would have decided gospel. we're going to assign this one to Matthew and this one to Luke? And uh, I don't know. Okay. No. <laughs> okay. that's, that's a good question. Um, what about all the other Gospels, the Gospel of Thomas and uh, all, all the other ah. Gospels that have strange stories in them and the, things, the non-canonical Gospels? Right. Uh, like the, the Gospel of Thomas is probably the most famous because I in that case there are some sayings in the Gospel of Thomas that are very close to the New Testament Gospels. Uh, it's, and there are debates among scholars still about to what extent would the writer of the Gospel of Thomas had known the Gospels in the New Testament or is he getting that? Is he getting those sayings attributed to Jesus from an independent source that was also the source for the writers of the New Testament? The Gospel of Thomas is. We don't have a manuscript in the manuscript tradition in Greek or Coptic because the full Gospel you find later in Coptic tradition uh, it is. It's much later, so it's difficult to determine how far back you can trace those traditions. Okay. How much of the character of Jesus was invented by Paul and how much do you think is historical? Actually, I, I, don't, I think Paul knew very little about Jesus. You, in terms of actual facts about Jesus' life, Paul gives us literally a handful of There's bits almost of information. In the epistles, he there? knows he has brothers. Uh, he knows about the Last Supper, which by the way is not in the Gospel of John. Um, he, he knows other bits of scattered information, but Paul, if he knew more about the historical Jesus, he's not telling us because yeah. Paul's total focus is on the, Jesus' death and resurrection. And for Paul, because he had some kind of experience, some, he had some kind of vision or experience, and that appears to motivate everything else he's writing in his letters because he's trying to figure out how to reconcile this vision or revelation he had with what is basically his tradition, uh, Jewish tradition.
and he keeps both. He doesn't reject Judaism at all. Uh, he still remains a, uh, an observant, we would say, observant Jew. That's, we, we use that today. You wouldn't, I wouldn't use that for the ancient world. There's a very famous passage, well, famous to me. <laughs> it's a passage in the book of Acts that says, Paul came back to Jerusalem at one point, and the leaders in Jerusalem said to him, who were very conservative, by the way, one of whom was James, Jesus' brother, they're still saying you have to be circumcised, you have to keep the Sabbath, you have to keep uh, kashrut, the food laws. It's a very conservative wing of the church. They are telling Paul, you know, Paul, we have a problem here. You're out there talking to Gentiles, to non-Jews, and telling them uh, they don't have to keep the law, they don't have to do all these things. And the people here in Jerusalem think you're telling everyone they don't have to keep the law. And so they ask Paul to take a vow uh, and to do certain things. By taking this vow, he is uh, showing people, no, I'm still observant, I still follow the law. But that, there's, there's a lot of whole new scholarship going on with how people mm. understand Paul in the last two decades. Okay. How much do we actually know about the historical Jesus? Depends on who you talk to. Um, there are different methods or criteria that scholars over the last even 200 years have devised to say how do you get back to the actual authentic sayings or deeds. Uh, and there was an historical Jesus, by the way, so that's not, a, that's not an issue. Uh, I should say that there's no Roman evidence at all in the first century. There are no Roman documents that refer to Jesus. The earliest Roman evidence comes in the early second century uh, with Pliny, with a guy named Tacitus, uh, for example. That's very, very little information. All we know is he was executed during the reign of Tiberius. Uh, and then the Jewish historian Josephus, at the very end of the first century, talks about, he has a brief passage about Jesus. He also has a passage about James, his, his brother. Um, I, I, I would, it's, it's everyone kind of reconstructs their own historical Jesus, I think sometimes based on the generation. So you get some scholars now, very prominent scholars, who create a kind of warm and fuzzy egalitarian Jesus who rages against the colonial Romans and all this kind of stuff. Uh, I, I don't, a lot of that is problematic. Um, I think that based on other Jewish groups in this period, I would say he probably had a fairly strongly apocalyptic message that the, that the kingdom was coming very soon. And coming soon. Right, yeah. Um, which was not uncommon among prophetic figures of right. his time, isn't that right? Right. right. Um, now, his na w w is it right that his name is, um, w I mean, the, Jesus is the Roman form. Um, what, what would the Jewish form of, of his name have been? Uh, Yeshua or Joshua. Yeah, Joshua. Joshua is also the same form. And, yeah. a, a, a very common name. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. when we say was Jesus a real figure, what we're saying is there was a wandering preacher wh whose name was Joshua, Yehoshua. Um, a, a Jesus of Nazareth, by the way. Of Nazareth. The Gospel of John knows that his father was Joseph and that he was born in Nazareth. Probably no one, well, I shouldn't say no one, but the general view of scholars is that he was not born in Bethlehem. No, I mean, the Bethlehem thing is another of those ful fulfilling a prophecy yeah. thing. Um, yeah. that's, an, that's the prophet based, Micah. Based on Micah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, so once again, um, the gospel writers, uh, Matthew and Luke, I think, had to get him to Bethlehem by, and they bought, got him to Bethlehem by different routes. The, the same, um, yeah, yeah, exactly there. And the virgin birth narrative, I, I don't think, I, I, Paul doesn't uh, seem aware at all of the virgin no. birth narrative. And what I think is interesting is the writer in the gospel of John seems not to be aware of that narrative no, at no. all. And I mean, the, John actually refers to him as coming from Nazareth with no mention of... Right. Of, in, uh, in John, the people say, the Messiah from, from Nazareth? Yes, yes. Because they assume, we they know assume. this guy's from Nazareth. Yes. So they, it's, what it's saying is that he was clearly not born in Bethlehem. Yes. Yeah. So the whole Bethlehem story, the whole virgin birth story, is just fulfilling Old Testament prophecies. In, and admittedly so. I mean, no... no well, but there are no it. virgin, actual virgin birth birth prophecies no, either. I mean, no. it's the, that, if that's you, just a mistranslation. You, yeah. What surprises me is that I've talked to respectable, uh, um, sophisticated theologians, including the recently retired Archbishop of Canterbury. I, I watched that debate, by the and way. And I said, um, of course, you don't believe in the virgin birth, do you? And he said, well, yes, I do, as a matter of fact. Um, <laughs> and I was absolutely bowled over by this, the, because I, I expected fundamentalists to believe in the virgin birth but for a respectable archbishop to believe in the virgin birth. 
well, there. I mean, in Catholic Catholic scholarship, by the way, has it, it changed. It changed drastically after Vatican II in the early '60s. Some of the most uh, highly respected, knowledgeable, excellent scholars in New Testament happen to be Catholic scholars. And you, you've t if you take one example, uh, Raymond Brown, who was one of the leading Sorry, scholars. Uh, uh, Robin, are you, are you making signals? What, what, what are you doing? Oh, sorry. I'm so sorry. But, um, <laughs> it's all right. Uh, uh, one very famous scholar who published a book about the birth of Jesus, uh, and he was one of the most highly respected scholars, a Catholic scholar and a priest, by the way. Um, he argued in very, um, in a roundabout way, but he basically was saying there was no virgin birth. Yeah, which was you know he he just yes. was going through the material and and he, as a Catholic scholar he had to conclude that. So. But once people knew that it was a mistranslation um, from Isaiah's he Hebrew to the to the Greek virgin, why was there any? I mean, why does any scholar even bother to talk about a virgin birth since it's known that it came from this deliberate fulfilling of a of an Old Testament? But, Prophecy. Well, the virgin, the idea of a virgin birth, or the idea of being that you are the product that your father was a god and your mother was a human, that in Greco-Roman period, if th that in this period we're talking it? about, it's extremely common. Anyone who was important at all, whether an emperor, uh, a philosopher, an athlete, so we could, we should do Michael Jordan. Um, it, they were, if you were anyone important who made a contribution to Roman society, if you were a great benefactor you of course would have been born of Zeus or some other god yeah. and your mother would have been human. It was extremely common. Yes. So the, the surprising thing would be if a gospel writer chose not to say Jesus was born of a virgin and his yes. father was yes. divine. Yes. You, you would have to... Yeah. Yeah. And could you say yeah. the same thing of the resurrection of Jesus as well? Uh, and that, that again is a, is a common myth, isn't it? Um, no. Among gods of, the, of that period and that. I don't know as much about the Greco-Roman period, but I can, you can talk about earlier ancient Near Eastern. Yes. Uh, Can in Canaanite uh, mythology, for example, um, with the whole discussion of, of Osiris in Egyptian texts. Yes. But there's been a lot of scholarship over the last couple of decades that have, sh have shown the whole idea of a dying and rising God, this kind of traditional idea we yeah. think of. There, it is problematic in some ways the way people read uh, text. It's, yes. it, it, you can't simply apply it to the New Testament the way some people right. uh, have done. Um, what about the idea of the scapegoat? What about the idea of dying in order to take sin away? Uh, is, that, is that a very common... I mean, that, that's obviously deep in Christian theology. Um, is that also a very common... Um, uh, it, it seemed you would have to... You could apply that to, in Jewish tradition, Yom Kippur, which is this idea of the, the goat. We, when we talk about the goat, the, there were two goats in Leviticus uh, 16, where the one goat is sent out into the wilderness and the other goat, they put their hands on the goat and transfer the sins of Israel. All the sins go into the yeah, goat. Yes. And the one goat. But, the, uh, but even that idea the, the, about substitutionary atonement is more problematic in later Jewish tradition. I, I should say that the story about Isaac in Genesis 22, yeah where he's almost sacrificed. Uh, later Jewish tradition, and there are all kinds of interesting material on this, went back and read that story and said, well, no, he wasn't, he wasn't actually uh, killed, but he nicked him with a knife, for example. And he lost so much blood. Well, how much blood did he lose? If he lost this much blood, that's kind of an atoning thing. If he lost this much blood, and it's a very fascinating tradition that's post-biblical, but one scholar, actually a scholar you may know from uh, Oxford, Geza Vermish, yeah, I do, uh, yes, a yeah. well-known scholar, yeah. wrote uh, decades ago a, a long essay about how he believed these stories about Isaac as a sacrifice that was meritorious for the ancestors or the descendants, there's a name for this in Jewish tradition, that he argued that those traditions in Judaism influence uh, Christianity and how they understood uh, Jesus and also the passages in Isaiah 53 about a servant who is suffering and a servant the that, suffering servant, that yeah. dies or yeah this, right. those passages are problematic yes. in their own way which was yeah. taken up by the Essenes of the Dead Sea Scrolls wasn't it the, the that that tradition the, of, the, of the suffering servant not well other different groups looked at those passages differently the, yeah. the debate about those passages is 
outside of Isaiah 53, if you look at the earlier passages starting in chapter 40 and following, you have this servant who appears at different times. And the servant is, in the biblical text, uh, clearly identified as Israel. It has no question. They said, my servant, uh, Israel, for example. Except when you get to Isaiah 53, then there, it's more problematic about what's going on with the servant. Uh, one very common view among scholars is the servant is the head of this community of exiles who was then uh, uh, maybe beaten or possibly killed by, by the Babylonians for various reasons. And uh, this is another whole discussion about what historically would have happened at the time these, at the time these chapters right. were written. But that's a much different thing than moving down 500 years, 600 years, yeah. and talking about yeah. how people use the text later. Yes. That's the case with all the things we're right. talking about. Um, so. As a biologist, I'm used to the idea that one of the greater threats to religious belief comes from my own subject of, of biology, well, science generally, but more specifically, evolutionary biology. But talking to you, I'm starting to get the idea that actually looking his, as a historian, at the Bible might be an even greater threat to, uh, re to religious faith. <laughs> uh, what do you think about that? Um, it, yes, it, can, it, it depends on what people, I mean, students who come to my classes come from all different uh, approaches or spectrums. Some students assimilate this kind of material and somehow, in some ways, partition it and just go on and carry on still a, a part of their tradition and other people don't. I mean, I couldn't say, you're right, in some, in some cases it is a threat if you're uh, taking a passage like Isaiah 714 and saying, this is not actually what's going on in the passage. Uh, you could choose to say, I, I would ignore the actual history of all this stuff, and I only care about how people later decided to read and mm. interpret these texts. So there's almost nothing left yeah. of the history. I mean, there's nothing left of the ancient Jewish history. There's oh. nothing, I mean, as far as religion is concerned, um, there's very little left of, of, um, of New Testament. No, uh, I, no, I wouldn't, that's another, I wouldn't say that. I would say, I mean, if you're talking about biblical history in the Old Testament, there's a lot of narratives that are clearly generally historical narratives. Uh, well, oh yes, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, but the, but the whole foundational myths of the Jewish religion, the, the Moses leading the Jews oh, out of okay. Israel, no. out, out, of, out of Egypt, yeah. um, you get rid of that, you get rid of King David, um, and then as far as Christianity is concerned, you get rid of the virgin birth, you get rid of the resurrection. Um, You're just ticking them all off. Very little years, known yeah. about Jesus himself at all. Um, you're not left with a hell of a lot as far as religion is concerned, are you? That's why I'm a Bible scholar. Yes. <laughs> well, Dr. Huddleston, thank you very much indeed. It's been thank a great you, privilege. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much.